Welcome to the Military Transition Podcast, Human Resources Pathfinder Series, where we share invaluable human resources career insights and HR tips and tools tailored specifically for the veteran community. I'm your host, Misty Marino. I served in the Air Force for 20 years and retired in 2020. I'm the marketing manager and content creator for vets to pm and I mentor veterans just like you through the military transition. In today's episode, we have the privilege of hosting Corey Maywald. Corey started his career in the Navy as a hospital corpsman. He quickly progressed into healthcare management and led various healthcare teams across military clinics and hospitals. In his roles, he also served in a human resources capacity, and that really sparked his interest to want to pursue this field full time. After 12 years of military service, he decided to break into talent acquisition and recruitment. He is now a talent acquisition partner, or otherwise known as a healthcare recruiter. Join us as we explore Corey's unique journey, his experiences and insights in HR, and how he leverages his diverse background to enhance talent acquisition and recruitment in the healthcare industry. Let's dive in. Welcome, Corey, to the show. I'd love for you to introduce yourself for our audience. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me, Misty. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Corey. I'm a talent acquisition professional. A little bit about me. I started my career in the Navy uh, back in 2010, right out of high school. Um, my uh, way of kind of entering the Navy was very unique. Um, I was originally supposed to join as an operations specialist, found out that I was colorblind, couldn't do that, um, and ultimately kind of joined as a hospital corpsman. Um, first couple years as a hospital corpsman, started off in basic patient care, taking care of sick and injured Marines um, and their family members. Basically, after a couple years, I kind of specialized in cardiovascular medicine, um, loved what I did there. But over the years, I quickly got promoted into more of like healthcare management type roles and kind of managed medical, dental, um, you know, and other hospital type, uh, you know, settings um, and their team members, doctors, physicians, nurses, so on and so forth. Um, and then, you know, over those couple of years, my role kind of slowly progressed into HR. Um, loved what I did, but I missed the, you know, component of, you know, patient care and being uh, in the medical setting. So while I was active duty, um, I also took a per diem job kind of working on the side as a CPR instructor. And wow. um, yeah, I loved what I did there. And, um, you know, the director of um, HR at the time, she kind of knew that I had some specialty and background in HR. And, um, you know, she was ultimately looking to grow her team during that time. And, um, you know, basically I had an interest in talent acquisition and recruitment. I started to do a little bit of recruitment to kind of help build their team. Absolutely fell in love with it. And after about 12 years in the Navy, I decided that I wanted to kind of focus on something a little bit more full-time in talent acquisition and recruitment. And, um, you know, I went through a onward to opportunity skill bridge myself. And, um, you know, that's where I really kind of targeted in on talent acquisition and recruitment found out that that was the avenue that I wanted to pursue. And then with my healthcare background, I just decided to focus on healthcare recruitment specifically. So about over the last two years since I transitioned out of the Navy, that's kind of been my area of focus lately. So. That's awesome. It's so much to unpack there because <laughs> that's PM, we are constantly preaching that every single veteran has some sort of transferable skill set, either to project management, human resources, cyber, whatever it may be. And so us as professionals, we're developing our skill set. And yes, that skill set can be utilized in this career field, this industry, this role and responsibility. But because we are professionals, we can transfer them to other roles, responsibilities, careers and industries. And so that's great that you are now a healthcare recruiter. Is I heard that right. Yep. So yep. you have background in healthcare but you also have transferable skills that are helping you with human resources. So fantastic. And then I also heard SkillBridge in there. And so we manage the SkillBridge program for 70 plus host companies. Um, so let's talk about SkillBridge, you know, before we get into human resources. So what made you decide to do a SkillBridge? And if it wasn't for SkillBridge, what would you not have today? Yeah, great question. So honestly, for me, SkillBridge, uh, about two, three years ago when I transitioned, um, it was still kind of fairly new. A lot of people didn't really know about 
you know, a lot of the opportunities that were out there for SkillBridge and, you know, just my time being, um, you know, out of the military, it's grown substantially. And, you Absolutely. know, there's so many organizations like Vets to PM, um, you know, and other, um, you know, avenues and resources that are out there now that kind of help transitioning service members expand their horizons for, you know, internship opportunities. Um, but when I went through, you know, I, I knew that, you know, military HR, um, and I, I did have some exposure to military HR, but as we know, military and civilian life, completely different. Um, it is so, so I, different. Oh, like, yeah. If, if we could just stress that to our audience, <laughs> military HR and civilian HR, completely different. So Absolutely. All of you senior NCOs and officers that think that you can just go into an HR manager or director role or executive role. I'm not saying you can't, but please know that there is a huge difference. Go ahead. Absolutely. And, <laughs> you know, that's where I was kind of going with this myself was, you know, I think for me, you know, when I first transitioned, one of the challenges that I faced was, you know, underestimating, uh, underestimating the employment market, really. Um, a lot of us, you know, we have a lot of transferable skills and we think just because we're veterans and we have that military experience yeah. that we're going to be able to easily transition into a field, um, you know, and, and kind of hit the ground running day one. Um, I would say that that's not necessarily the case. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of transferable skills that we can bring to the table that are going to make us excel in those roles ultimately. Um, but there's still a lot of a learning curve. Um, and for me, you know, I, I knew that if I was applying to some of these positions, my level of confidence wasn't going to be what I needed it to be to be successful in that role. Sure, I may have, you know, landed an opportunity as like an HR generalist or, you know, an HR manager right out of the gate. But I would have, you know, doubted myself and I would have had a lot of questions of like, am I doing this right? And, um, you know, I didn't want to start my career that way. I wanted to make sure that I was set up for success. So that's kind of the skill bridge area that I kind of leaned into. Um, Onward to Opportunity basically kind of introduced me to the PHR track. Um, you know, again, I did have that military HR, you know, background and healthcare background. And I was able to, you know, go through that program and learn more about HR and kind of the different specialties. Um, and that's where I really found out that HR is just more than policies, procedures, development. There's so much other, you yeah. know, uh, I guess ties to HR. You know, you have compensation, benefits, uh, being an HR generalist, an HR business partner, talent acquisition and recruitment. And I Data think analysis. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. data analytics and people analytics is huge and on the rise right now. And, you know, yep. definitely ties AI. into, you know, AI and talent yeah. acquisition. So, um, you know, for me, I think without going through the skill bridge, I, I, I would have felt lost and I wouldn't have known where to start. Yeah. Um, so getting exposed to like an HR skill bridge for me was instrumental in, in not only setting me up for success, but ultimately kind of pushing me down the path that I'm currently down. Um, you know, there was a lot that I learned about like benefits and policies and procedures that put me to sleep. I, I did not like that <laughs> side of HR, uh, just being fully transparent for some people, you know, that's exactly what they want to go into, um, you know, in, in employee relations, you know, it's a very stressful job, but it's very rewarding as well. Um, you know, a big focus right now in, in HR and, and basically HR has kind of gone from being human resources now to like people experience or people services. So we're, yeah. we're seeing that that change in the trend now. Yeah. And um, a, a lot of that with that is, you know, talent acquisition, recruitment and then retention. So, <clears throat> you know, being exposed to being an employee relations specialist and being able to handle those hard to have conversations and, and retaining staff uh, is definitely not for, uh, you know, everybody, but definitely yeah. a critical field. So that's good. Yeah. This, the skill bridge opportunity, it's available there. Right. And so if your command allows you to do it, whatever admin bridge you have to cross, I always recommend a skill bridge, even if it's an opportunity that is maybe not something that you know, sets your soul on fire, or maybe you think it's not your dream job. The one thing that I know me and you are very similar in our thought process is that we don't know yet. We don't know what our dream job is. We don't know what we actually like outside of the uniform because most of us are very militarized, right? Like for instance, I thought that I loved high stress environments and what, no, 
I really, no, I really <laughs> don't like high stress environments. I just thrived in them because that's all I experienced in the military, right? And so when my skill bridge opportunity presented itself, I learned all about recruiting as well. That's when I actually fell in love with recruiting. But unfortunately, I never was able to actually do recruiting. I, I now get to a little bit in my role at Bets to PM, but I also was introduced to different you know, HR information systems, to the orientation process, onboarding process, the visa process, and, you know, benefits and compensation. And so that is what, that is really what opened my eyes up to the fact that there's so many different things that we can do in HR. And so for the veteran community, we have talent acquisition, we have recruitment and selection, we have training and development, you know, we have data um, analysis. I was a human resource business partner for two and a half years. So why don't you share some roles that you see in the HR world and maybe just introduce some things to the veterans? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll start with my specialty of talent acquisition and recruitment, because that's kind of, you know, my subject matter expertise, I guess. Um, you know, talent are acquisition. You gonna, are you going to tell us that all recruiters ghost? Oh, <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, each recruiter is definitely built differently and there are some oh, yeah. bad apples that are out there, um, yep. you know, but I would say, you know, majority of the recruitment industry, they really want to help um, and they may be, you know, uh, I guess, interrupted by, uh, you know, system processes and, and ultimately, you know, not having the resources to ultimately make them successful. And, you know, this this area and this industry is is still fairly new. Talent acquisition yeah. is something that you know, over the last couple of years has really started to grow. Prior to that, you know, we were called recruiters um, and we still do recruitment, but, um, you know, being able to have those pipelines kind of built. So that way, when we do have those openings, we have, you know, a network of individuals that we're able to then, you know, present these job opportunities that they'd be a good fit for within, you know, our organizations. So the, the focus of, kind of short term, like we need to fill this role right now versus the long term planning and having those steps in place to be able to quickly fill those positions is now starting to evolve. So that's kind of my area of subject matter expertise in, in talent acquisition and recruitment. Um, you know, a lot of us in this industry, we kind of fall into it accidentally. Um, there is no true pathway to becoming a recruiter, in, in my honest opinion. Um, there's no official school that's out there to teach you how to be a recruiter. There's no, um, you know, a, a official certification uh, to make you a recruiter. But there are a bunch of industry level cert certificates that can help you expand on those recruitment and talent acquisition skills. Um, so, you know, honestly, it really is about networking to get into this yeah. uh, this industry. Um, you have to have great sales skills, great people skills, um, great communication. Um, and then not only that, but you also have to kind of have that business mindset now, um, which is something that's fairly new to uh, a lot of recruiters that are out there that kind of fell into this industry. Um, yeah. You know, typically what we're usually seeing in this field is before it was, hey, you're only focused on recruitment. Now you really need to know the other areas of the business and what's going on. Um, you know, what are our workforce planning, you know, uh, developments that are in place for this year? Bring out um, the vocab. <laughs> yeah. Like what are our goals? You know, um, you know, our metrics for the year, um, you know, where do we see ourselves in the next two to five years? These are all, you know, questions that we have to ask and it's multiple layers of the business. You know, you're partnering very closely with your HR business partners, your HR generalist, your onboarding teams, um, your managers, you know, compensation, right? managers, yeah. your hiring managers and benefits. Um, and there, there's multiple layers to kind of this. And if one thing falls through, then it impacts the entire candidate experience. So there, there is a lot of layers to kind of work through uh, within talent acquisition. Um, and, you know, ultimately you're trying to provide that great candidate experience because talent out here moves very, very quickly nowadays. Absolutely. Yeah. So, Let's let's expand on that. So who should not be an HR professional or specifically a recruiter? It is important to stress the fact that talent acquisition is different than recruiting. Absolutely. So, so for people that are wondering, talent acquisition is different from recruiting. Although some companies combine, and if we were to peel the onion back, we would be able to see the disadvantages of that. 
but talent acquisition and recruiting are two separate um, tiers. And so it's just important to stress that. But why don't you share based on your, you know, your veteran experience and based on your civilian experience, who doesn't make an effective and efficient HR professional and recruiter? Absolutely. So I would say that if you're a very structured person and you like, you know, your day to look the same every single day <laughs> um, and you like to check things off your list every single day, then talent acquisition and recruitment is probably not the best for you. Um, and the reason that I say that is because there's a lot of moving parts in this in this field. Um you know, specifically, you know, I could be waiting to hear back from a candidate for an offer that I extended yeah. um, and I can't close that out. So if you're one of those people that like you have to have those things closed out each day, otherwise it's going to drive you absolutely bonkers, um, then this might not be the, the best kind of field to go into. Um, but if you love something, you know, new and exciting every single day, and you like to be able to bounce back and forth between different tasks, you know, throughout the day, then I would say that, you know, not only is talent acquisition and recruitment a great industry to get into, but just HR in general. Um, Absolutely. You know, yeah, one you, minute. You're not getting bored. Yeah. You won't be bored. And if you are bored, then it, it might be just based on your organization. But if you're a part of a mid-sized to large size organization, you're probably not getting bored. <laughs> oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> There's definitely a lot to do. And um, like I said, a lot of different moving parts, you know, part of my day is, you know, talent acquisition is, you know, I may start off my day with kind of sourcing, you know, getting out yep. there, actually finding, you know, some great talent for my open positions that I have. And then the next minute I'm, you know, calling those people to get them scheduled for phone screens so I can go through the screening process, make sure that they meet, you know, what the hiring manager is looking for, for those, you know, opportunities. The next minute, I may have a hiring manager that's pinging me on Microsoft Teams, letting me know, hey, Corey, we want to extend an offer. Um, so, you know, dropping that, what I'm doing, reaching out to that, you know, candidate to extend an offer. Then the next minute, I may be negotiating for that offer, um, you yeah. know, going back and forth in terms of, you know, compensation, um, you know, and the next minute, I may be opening a new position and having an intake meeting with the hiring manager to find out exactly what they're looking for, for that specific, you know, role. Um, and then, you know, the next minute I may be in an HR meeting talking about uh, how we can make improvements, you know, on our onboarding process or through our talent acquisition process. So there's just so much, um, you know, that kind of goes on in my day to day. And, you know, one thing that's definitely set me up for success is being able to manage my calendar. Uh, you know, I, I think that that was a huge adjustment kind of coming from the military into civilian HR was in, in the military, you were kind of expected to drop everything in a moment's notice, right? And we needed to get this done right here, right now. And in some cases, you know, depending on your job, it could be life and death. Yeah. Um, you know, and in, in corporate America, it, it may be a little bit different, you know, things may be urgent, but they're not an emergency, right? Um, so being able to kind of set some of those boundaries and then also being able to prioritize your calendar to set you up for success and then set those reminders as well has been yeah. you know critical for me as a recruiter. Yeah, it's really good. And, you know, obviously every organization is different. So when we talk about talent acquisition and recruiting and HR, you know, it really is dependent on the organization. You know, policies, procedures, and initiatives are going to differ in a small scale company versus a, you know, midsize or large organization. But when it does come to recruiting, you know, you said if you like a structured um, schedule, if you like to know, you know, exactly what you're going to be doing every single day, if you like peace and quiet, um, and if you like to feel satisfied all the time, then you're probably not a good fit for recruiting. However, a small organization recruitment office might be something for you. It just kind of depends. And so we've talked about maybe what doesn't make a good fit. So let's talk about what makes a good fit. So based on my experience, you know, I've worked with some effective recruiters and I've worked with some ineffective recruiters. And I really like that category because it really kind of just depends on the organization, right? What's effective, what's ineffective. So I believe follow up and follow through is effective. You help us out. What yeah. what other qualities are um are have proven to be effective for 
talent acquisition and recruiting specialists? Absolutely. So I would say communication is definitely the number one. Um, as you mentioned before, those follow-ups are absolutely critical. You know, in, in this job market, we're seeing, you know, especially for like remote positions at this point, yeah. you know, there was recently that I had an opening for one of my positions that I was recruiting for. It was a basic customer service uh, level position, fully remote. And within 24 hours, I had received over 350 applications. So if that kind of tells you anything of how quickly these, these roles are becoming almost overwhelming uh, for the recruitment and talent acquisition teams to kind of sort through this level of talent that's applying, it, it's so, so crazy. Um, and again, you know, as a recruiter or as a talent acquisition professional, you definitely want to make sure that you're at least closing the loop with those, you know, people who apply to your positions, whether that's you know, directly through your applicant tracking system that you're utilizing and making sure that you're sending the appropriate disposition emails to let them know, hey, we've reviewed your application, but unfortunately we're moving forward with, you know, talent that more closely aligns with what the business is looking for um, or, you know, scheduling those initial phone screens with the qualified applicants and then keeping them informed throughout that process. Because, you know, as we both know, I may, you know, interview or have, you know, a phone screen for, let's just say three candidates today, and the hiring manager may not get to them until next week, right? And it's my responsibility as the, you know, talent acquisition professional to not only stay on top of the hiring manager to say, hey, where are we with this and set those recurrent or cadence meetings, um, you know, for follow ups. But also following up with those candidates to say, hey, this is our you know, timeline of what we're kind of expecting. Um, you know, if you don't hear anything from me, please follow up with me. Don't hesitate to you know, send me an email, a phone call, a text message, um, and I'll try to keep you updated in the process as well. So yeah. um, communication, absolutely paramount to be you know, a, a successful recruiter or talent acquisition professional. Um, but ultimately, you know, be, having the ability to stay uh, organized and to multitask as well is probably another key feature, um, you know, of being successful in this industry. Because again, yeah, like, so many moving parts. Yeah, I like to describe multitasking and mean you could, we could have different, you know, definitions, but I like to describe instead of saying like multitasking, because I can just, <laughs> I can, I, I know recruiters that you know, will keep both of their phones, like their work phone and their personal phone. And every notification that comes up, they're looking down. Um, anything on the teams, you know, they're they're looking at blah, blah, blah. And then they, you know, witch and complain that they don't get anything done. And so I always like to say, it's not necessarily multitasking. It's being able to task switch and then switch back. Task switch, switch back. And for recruiting, sometimes you do have to just turn off the notifications, finish this task, and then go back. But you do have to have some sort of follow-up system, right? It's like, I call it like task in the queue. And so an example would be like someone, because unfortunately people will message you on Teams and on your phone, right? And on LinkedIn and whatever. And so I found to be beneficial is that if I got a message on my phone, I would put the task in the queue, okay? George messaged me, I'm putting it in the queue. And then at the end of the day, I'm looking at my queue and kind of figuring out what do I need, you know, to prioritize whatever it may be. But yeah, communication, you touched on something and I think our audience would love for you to talk about it. You know, I've talked about it on previous podcasts, but it's great to hear from someone who is like in the mix doing it now. So you talked about how, you know, you put a job up there and all of a sudden now you have 300. So without you know, um, maybe disclosing any sort of things that you can't disclose, you know, veterans are getting um, are upset that they're not hearing back or they're getting generic emails. And I would love, I have, you know, I, I can share my experience, but I would love to hear from you. Talk about why recruiters can't be very specific when it comes to, you know, feedback um, why sometimes we're not getting back to people. Why don't you share your experience on that to help the veterans maybe feel a little bit better about not hearing back all the time? Yeah, of course. You know, first and foremost, I would say that it has nothing to do with, you know, their skill set, right? We we all know that they're extremely qualified and that, um, you know, they have a lot of the transferable skills. And I know at the time, 
you know, even myself, you know, going through my transition when I was applying to jobs, I was getting the thanks, but no thanks. And, you know, I had my MBA, I had recruitment specific certifications and was like, what is going on here? Like, yeah, something's got to give. Um, at the end of the day, it's not you. And I know in the moment it may feel like, you know, it, it's almost a punch in the gut, really. Um, but I can I can assure you that each no is directing you to that that yes and where you truly belong. So don't give up hope. But to answer your question, it is tough. It, it really is. You know, some recruiters are definitely better than others, and some talent acquisition professionals are definitely better than others. There are a few bad apples in this industry that, you know, we're trying to shed light on. And a lot of us that are passionate about this industry, we definitely want to make some changes. And, you know, um, you could tell who the good recruiters are that are out there. Um, And there's a ton of them that are out there on LinkedIn. Um, For those veterans who may be kind of struggling to kind of break into an industry or may just, you know, be applying and getting those thanks, but no thanks. and, And they're really struggling to land those interviews. My recommendation would be this. You know, obviously you want to target your resume to every single position that you're applying for. Um, I I see this time and time again (laughs) that, you know, most people when they're applying to these roles, you know, they may just be kind of, I I don't want to call it rage applying, but just randomly applying to anything and everything that's out there that they think that they'd be a good fit for just using one standard, you know, master resume, right? Um, but this market is extremely competitive. Yeah. You know, I had the advantage when I got out that I, I was lucky enough that the market was competitive, but not as competitive as it is right now. Um, but, you know, it, it's definitely crazy out there and you definitely have to set yourself up for success. You have to have the your best foot forward with your resume, essentially, and you have to network into a lot of these opportunities. So, you know, get out there on LinkedIn, you know, connect with other veterans that are in these fields that you're interested in kind of going into, whether that's HR, project management, you know, whatever it may be. And, you know, ask for informational interviews. Most of these veterans that are out there, they will gladly in a heartbeat set something up with you, whether that's an hour or two hours, you know, a call or a Zoom, uh, you know, Microsoft Teams meeting, and they'll connect with you and they'll give you, you know, the pros and cons to the job, what it kind of looks like a day in the life, right? Um, how to set yourself up for success, qualifications, skills, certifications, you know, degrees that can really set you apart from the pack um, and getting that feedback. And then basically from there, what you can do is kind of do like a skills assessment really and determine what do I have versus what do I not have? And, you know, does that mean that I need to go back to school? Does that need, mean that I need to, you know, leverage my network to, to kind of get into an opportunity like this? And then you can really, truly go from there and, and really expand. The other thing, you know, that I would also recommend is, you know, see if there's some of the companies that you may be interested in. Um, you know, I'm sure a lot of people probably have those top, you know, 50 companies that they're interested in working for you know, that may be aligned with like their mission, vision, values um, that they've been following for quite some time, right? If that is the case, reach out, you know, to other veterans on LinkedIn that are actually at those companies and see if they're willing to give you a referral or if they're willing to kind of forward your resume along to the hiring team or see if there's a veteran that's on the talent acquisition team at that company. Um, A lot of the times they're going to connect with you And, you know, they may see that you're a transitioning service member or a veteran. And a lot of the times they're willing to work with you to help you boost your resume because they know the skill set that you can bring and how valuable you would be at that organization. So hopefully that kind of helps. Yeah, it does help. And I I think it's important, you know, you said it's it's them, not you, you know. Um, But before that, you, you have to do the work. So as a veteran, we're not just going to get you know, an opportunity because we're a veteran, because there's a lot of other, you know, protected classes out there as well. So we have to be careful of assuming that everyone wants to hire a veteran, because sometimes the reputation of veterans is actually not very positive. And so we have to be mindful of that is that we have to do the work. So start with depositing into your network before you ask for withdrawals, right? And so establish your personal brand on LinkedIn, get on LinkedIn, engage, comment, add to the discussion, you know, deposit information, educate, inform, entertain. You know, people always ask me, 
you know, what do I do on, on LinkedIn? You educate, you inform, you entertain, and you do that within your skill set. You do that within your industry. And that is how you can, you know, um, sort of deposit into this LinkedIn community. LinkedIn is only as good as the LinkedIn users, right? And then Absolutely. that way you can develop a network. I loved what you said, reach out to those veterans that are either on the talent acquisition team or maybe in the company, you know, ask for informational interviews, you know, be mindful of just connecting with veterans that went back to the Department of Defense. If you want to get into the civilian sector, you need to reach out to civilians, you know, veterans that are now civilians, right, working in the civilian sector. And think about, you know, I'll start throwing some things out and Corey, you jump in. So when you apply to a position, when you apply matters, why? Yeah, that's great. Um, you know, timing is everything. Um, you know, it, it may be that um, when you apply to the role, you know, we may have been, you know, three, four weeks into the recruitment process at this point, And we already have, you know, four, five, six you know, extremely qualified candidates that we've submitted to the hiring manager that they already have, you know, interview scheduled or have already interviewed. Um, and when you apply to the role, that hiring manager may have already, you know, made that determination that this is somebody that I want to move forward with. So, you know, it is it is tough and it is challenging to kind of keep your finger on the pulse of, you know, when these job opportunities are coming out, but also, you know, making sure that you're applying in a, a quick and efficient manner uh, yeah. when these positions open up, because a lot can change in, you know, a day, two days, let alone a couple of weeks. Um, and just because it's a no now doesn't necessarily mean that it's a no in the future, right? Um, you know, these businesses are going to continue on, they're going to continue hiring. And, you know, just because you weren't selected for that specific opening, that hiring manager could have been looking for somebody you know, that, that had a little bit more skill set, maybe they were entertaining them as, you know, somebody that could potentially train other team members, you know, on their team. And then, you know, in a couple months, they may have another opening that you would be a good fit for. And I, I think that this is where the difference in recruitment and talent acquisition comes in, right? Because Absolutely. recruiters, um, you know, and, and again, the, the name is kind of, you know, broad and it's changing from organization to organization. But yeah. for the most part, we're, we're shifting that mindset from just recruitment to talent acquisition because we want that forward thinking, thinking process. And just because you're not a good fit for that role, right, I'm going to keep you in my pipeline. So if I see yep. that you're very talented and that you have yeah. a good resume and, you know, maybe this opportunity didn't work out, I'm still going to reach out to you and say, hey, I've received your application. I think that, you know, you'd be a great fit. However, you know, unfortunately, the hiring manager did move forward with somebody else, but I definitely want to stay in touch, you know, for future opportunities. You know, we're always hiring here at X company. Um, you know, let's stay in touch over the next, you know, coming months. If I have anything that pops back up, I will definitely reach out and following through with that, you know, set reminders. You know, I, I think yeah. this is important as a, you know, a talent acquisition professional is, you know, follow through, like you mentioned. Um, you know, a lot of these ATSs have some really great features that are out there now where you can set, uh, you know, reminders in the yeah. system to reach out to these people in two months, three months. Um, and, you know, I think the more that we do that, the the better this industry is ultimately going to become. Absolutely. Yeah. And when it comes to timing, too, like, you know, if you put a we call it requisition or you put a posting out there, you know, um, you have to be mindful too that recruiters. How do I say this, Corey, to be professional? <laughs> be transparent. But, <laughs> well, I was just, you know, HR is not usually your most manned office. So recruiters are doing, and talent acquisition professionals, they're doing so many other roles. So if a posting goes up, right, and the posting closes, your recruiters are most likely going to work from bottom up, right? And so you might have a different process, but most recruiters work bottom up. And so therefore, within the first five applicants, if we find people that we could submit to the hiring manager, then unfortunately, everyone else who applies, you know, is probably going to not get touched, right? And so if you utilize your applicant tracking system effectively, which this is sort of where, you know, recruiters get the, the bad reputation is that we don't effectively close out the that the requisition, we don't send the email, 
But can you explain, Corey, why does the email have to be generic? Yeah, great so, question. Yeah, because this is where people, they want they want to know why I wasn't looked at. They want to know what in the interview, you know, like set whatever. Why can't it be specific? Yeah. Well, you know, I would say, you know, probably one of the number one reasons is obviously, you know, depending on the level of position that you may be recruiting for, trust me, most recruiters and most talent acquisition professionals or HR professionals, they want to follow up with you and they want oh, yeah. to <laughs> give you some feedback and essentially say like, hey, it just came down to this person had a little bit more, you know, experience, right? Um, but unfortunately, you know, a lot of us, we're really, you know, like you said, we're we're kind of understaffed in this in this field. Um, it may not seem like it because, you know, uh, right now this is the most competitive that HR's truly been, but I feel oh, yeah. like in this day and age, we're doing more with less. Um, and it, it's definitely becoming challenging for, um, you know, basically HR to do everything within a day, right? Um, there's some days where I'm working, you know, until like six, seven o'clock trying to close things out because I want to follow up and I want to, you know, provide that quality candidate experience. But, you know, the, the more that I try to do, sometimes it interferes with my personal life, right? And I still need to have somewhat of a work-life balance so I don't get burnt out. Um, and, and it truly is challenging, um, you know, and I, I feel like most recruiters um, and most talent acquisition professionals, they truly do care, um, you know, about providing the best candidate experience possible. And, you know, in the next coming years as AI kind of, you know, launches and, and we start to get into that, um, I really think that it's going to help with a lot of the administrative kind of, I don't want to say burdens, but for lack of better terms at the moment, yeah. there is a lot of administrative kind of time that is spent away from actual recruitment, um, you know, and ultimately other HR tasks. Um, yeah. And we would love to get to all of those things, but until automation kind of helps us with that, you know, we're bound by time. So I, I think that that's one of the number one things is, you know, there's not enough time in the day to follow up with each person uh, individually to give them that feedback. Um, and, you know, with that, obviously we still want, you know, each person to at least get the, hey, we received your application and unfortunately we won't be moving forward. Um, and at least close it out, right? So you know. Um, yeah. There are some studies that are out there. Um, I wish I had the details right in front of me, but um, I, I recently read an article that um, I, I think it said about um, like over 80% of people who never hear anything back from a company that they applied to, they're not going to apply to any of their future opportunities, right? So those people who aren't ever hearing anything back when they apply to a position, they're very likely no longer going to want to work for that organization if they, if they don't ever get that thanks, but no thanks email. So at a yeah. minimum, you know, we definitely need to make sure that we're doing that, but um, yeah, it's, it, it is, it is crazy out there. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, for, for recruiters in general, like people who, you know, want to break into the industry, you know, get to know your applicant tracking system. What can your applicant tracking system do for you? Even before AI emerged as this, you know, new technology, applicant tracking systems have had AI for a while. You know what I mean? You just have to really get to know your applicant tracking system. What can it do for you? There's a lot of automation that is available to you. So you touched on, you know, yeah, you're going to get that generic email, but that is our way of following up and following through. It just looks different because you want specific feedback. There's other reasons why we can't give specific feedback. It comes down to, you know, um, specific hiring practices within the organization, but we also have labor laws that we need to adhere to. We have to be mindful that if we give specific feedback, that feedback can be misconstrued or perceived, and then now all of a sudden we have some sort of litigation on our hands, right? And so sometimes it's safer to just go with the generic emails because humans have proven that they can be a-holes, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, um, but I did want to touch on, you know, Corey, maybe you can help fill this in. You know, a lot of people believe that if you're getting the email that says, you know, hey, we've received your application, but unfortunately we're going in another direction. It can mean a lot of things. Number one, it can mean that you're, you know, unfortunately maybe you applied 
later than other people. And so your, your application and your resume didn't even get looked at, but we found who we needed to find, right? It can mean that. Also, it can mean, you know, when hiring managers and recruiters, when they look at the people that are applying, they also have to consider the people that are already in the department, right? And so um, maybe you can talk a little bit to that. Like, we don't want five Misty's on the team. We can't have five Corey's on the team. We need diversity, not only diversity in gender, gender, ethnicity, or, um, you know, whatever it may be, but diversity of talent, diversity of education, diversity of thought, diversity of, you know, KSAs, knowledge, skills, and abilities. Can you talk a little bit to that? Yeah, of course. And, you know, we're kind of seeing this trend right now as well in, in 2024. So this is a great topic to kind of touch on. Uh, you know, I read an article recently that, um, you know, a lot of companies right now are kind of focused on upskilling right now. Um, so a, a lot of companies, you know, they may post these positions um, and they may have it posted externally and internally. So they're receiving, you know, those external applicants where you're able to apply, but they may already have internal candidates that are kind of already in mind. Uh, you know, for some of these roles. And, you know, like you said, it can come down to a lot of different variable factors of why you may not have been selected for that specific position, even though that you were extremely qualified. Um, again, this is probably yeah. the most competitive market that we have seen. Um, and, you know, definitely, I was, I was, yeah. yeah, I would say definitely in the last 12 to 13 years, it's the most competitive, you know? So, I mean, if you're not getting feedback or you're not getting in, like you're not the only one. It's, it's sucky to say that, but you're not. So it's not a you thing, you know, go ahead. Yeah, Sorry. Of course. No. And, you know, I was just going to add to the mix, you know, uh, right now, you know, companies are having to face those tough realities of, you know, potentially laying off employees and we're seeing record numbers of, you know, layoffs and restructurings. And, you know, I was even impacted a couple months back, um, you know, where I kind of had to get back onto the job market and go, kind of all through this all over again. And it is tough out there. You know, I faced rejections even as a qualified recruiter, um, you know, but a lot of these other organizations that may be, you know, potentially laying off some of their teams, you're competing with people from major Fortune 500 companies that have that uh, high level of experience. And, you know, it's almost oversaturating the market. So um, again, it, it does come down to timing. Um, I know that you know, when you do receive those rejections, it's absolutely terrible and it's heartbreaking. And, um, you know, a lot of us take it personally, myself included sometimes. But I think, you know, kind of having that resiliency in this job market is critical to being able to bounce back and, you know, focus on what's ahead. Um, you know, my biggest, uh, you know, piece of advice is every no is pushing you that much closer to the yes and truly where you belong. Um, you know, a no tomorrow doesn't mean a no from, you know, six months down the line, yeah. just because that company, you know, ultimately said no, you know, continue to, you know, research their opportunities that they have available, stay in contact with those recruiters. If you had a great candidate experience, even though you weren't selected for the role, a lot of those recruiters and talent acquisition professionals, they're going to remember you. Um, and when they have an opportunity that comes knocking, they're going to reach out to you. I can guarantee it. Yeah. And don't burn any bridges. So you might be really upset that you went through a five, you know, five step interview process and you didn't get selected, but like how you handle the rejection will be what's remembered. And I think that's really important. You know what I mean? And if a recruiter is effective, they're building their pipeline, their talent pipeline in the background, and they're 100% keeping you in mind for anything that comes up. And a really effective, you know, recruiter is going to know where you, you know, best meet as far as the requirements and, and maybe, hey, you know what, I know you applied here, but based on your interview, I, I think you're good for here. Why don't you apply here? So build connections with your recruiter. Um, and, and one thing I would like to, to stress, and, and Corey, you mentioned it. There are some bad apples out there, 100%, just like there's bad apple engineers and there's bad apple teachers and coaches and whatever. And so I always stress to people, focus on what you can control. And so an exercise that I do all the time, I still do it to this day, but I especially did it when I was in the job search, is I would take 10 minutes and I would 
download everything that was on my mind that was stressing me out, making me anxious, things I was worried about. And then I would take another 10 minutes and I would circle all of the things that I could control. And anything that was circled, I would go ahead and focus on. So what actions can I take? What mindset can I apply? What can I do? Whatever it may be. And so when it comes to the job search, Corey, what are some things that veterans can control? Oh, I love this question. (laughs) Um, You know, I would say, you know, one of the most top priorities that veterans should probably have is pick five things that are important to you in your next employer. Um, It could be more than five, but at a bare minimum, the top five things that you may be looking for, whether that's compensation, whether that's a good culture fit, whether that's, you know, benefits for you and your family that you're looking for, um, a work-life balance, and and prioritize those five things or more. Um, And this is really going to help you determine, you know, where you ultimately want to be. I think as veterans, when we first transition out of the military, you know, all we see is that that fancy, uh, you know, monetary value. And we're like, I want to make as much money as possible. Right. Um, but money's not everything. And, you know, if there's one thing that I've kind of learned, you know, going through all of this as well is, you know, yeah, money pays the bills, right. And, you know, good salary and good compensation structure is definitely important, but so is the total compensation package. And so is, you know, having a good culture fit because I'm sure you and I both know, you know, a majority of the statistics are, you know, most veterans that get in their first position, they usually don't stay there for, you know, a little over a year, right? I'm guilty of it. I stayed longer than that, but your first job is usually not the job that you keep. (laughs) Exactly. And again, it's okay, um, right? Yeah. Uh, We all learn, we all understand that, you know, there may be different priorities that we kind of have when we are transitioning out. And then once we kind of get that skill set and, you know, we, we learn the things that we like and the things that we don't like, then we have other opportunities. I tell this all the time as well is, you know, your first opportunity may not be your dream job of what you expected it to be. Um, I know that I'm guilty of it. And I think, you know, some other people that I've spoken to and mentored in the past as well, um, they may go into a position thinking that they were going to stay in this position forever. And this was their dream home, Right. And life kind of happened and that necessarily wasn't the case anymore. Um, That's completely okay. It's okay to not be in your dream position, you know, your first role outside of the military. The the key difference here is you are the one that paves your way of success and what that looks like. Um, So in the military, I think we all went through these career development boards and we went through somebody kind of telling us, this is your career path. This is what you need to do to ultimately make this rank or work your way up to being, you know, this type of, um, you know, role or officer program or whatever it may be. But now there's really nobody that's driving that factor anymore. It's all up to you. you. Um, So you kind of determine your career path, how quickly that moves, um, the direction that you want it to move. And it's okay if it changes. Um, you know, one thing that I recommend is setting time aside for yourself, you know, whether it's quarterly, every six months, every year to kind of have, I guess, an updated conversation with yourself to essentially yeah, like say, a come to Jesus meeting with yourself. Yeah. And, and kind of like yeah. your own career development board of like, okay, here's where I'm at currently. This is what I want to do. These are the things that I like. These are the things that I don't like. Where do I see myself in the next year? Where do I see myself in the next, you know, five years? And then you could really start to kind of develop your own career path. And, you know, whether that's being internal to your own organization that you're currently with, if they're able to provide those things, you can start having those conversations with your manager or other, you know, members of the business to see if that's something that they can create for you. And if it's just not aligned, then, you know, you may need to kind of go out there and, and find something that that is already built. Um, yeah. And that may be a new opportunity that you kind of dive into, you know, in the next year, two years, five years or whatever that looks like. So um, that, that would be my biggest advice, I would say. Yeah, I always, you know, I preach a lot, you know, take your transition one year at a time and come up with your non-negotiables. So just like what you said, what are five things that you want from a company? I always say, what are your non-negotiables for your post-service career? So when you were in the military, what were the things that you bitched about, you know, that you wanted work-life balance, you wanted this, you wanted that, 
So those are your non-negotiables. And so when you do look for a role, those are the things that you should be asking questions about. I'm not an advocate for asking about culture because I don't know about you, but when I was in interviews, I'm not telling a prospective candidate about the culture of our organization, especially because the culture wasn't desirable. You know what I mean? So I want you to ask me questions that I can actually share specifics on. So as an example, if one of your non-negotiables is that you want to be able to, you know, drop your kid off at school and pick them up, then you want to ask questions concerning what's a normal work day. What are the hours like? What is an on-call, you know, what does that look like? If, if, you know, what are my weekends? Like ask questions around the work hours. If one of your non-negotiables is not to travel more than 20%, that's a question to ask. You know, I'm a big advocate for asking questions about the company and blah, blah, blah. But I also think that you have to remember that you're interviewing them as well. And yeah. I can find company information. And let's just be honest, we're not going to put all of the company information, the true company information on the website, right, Corey? And maybe this goes against everything that you preach, but ask the questions that are going to get you the answers that help you make the decision as well. Because just because Corey offers you the job doesn't mean that you have to accept it, right? And so speaking of things that you can control, outline those things that you really want from your next organization. But keep in mind that it only has to be for one year at a time. And then have that conversation with yourself, like you suggested, Corey, and, you know, outline, like in 2023, I woke up like January 1st and I was like, I want a different life. I want more time freedom. I want to work on creative projects and I want to work with people that actually want to work with me. And within like three months of 2023 at, you know, at my last job, I was like, this job is just not going to make the cut. You know, this is what I want for 2023. It's just not going to make the cut. So then I made some strategic moves and didn't change jobs until 2024. But you bet your butt all throughout 2023, I was looking at those non-negotiables. You know, I was making a way for myself. I was uh, I was interviewing in the background. You know, I did it on PTO or maybe did it afterwards or on a lunch break, you know, and um yeah, you're not stuck, right? You're not stuck. You have choices. What's, you know, what's one other thing that we can control when it comes to the job search? Yeah, great. Um, and I like how you kind of said, you know, you're interviewing the company just as much as they're interviewing you. Oh, so yeah. you truly want to make sure that it's a good fit for you and your family um, as well. And just because you did receive an offer doesn't necessarily mean that you need to accept that offer, right? Um, no. You know, you can absolutely feel free to take your time to review that offer, go through the details, ask the questions. Um, Total you know, compensation too. So people exactly. focus on salary, which is important, but you want to look at total compensation. And then any compensation that's revolved around a bonus, ask specific questions. When was the last time that bonus was awarded? Because, you know, I mean, I've been, you know, like super like, oh, wow, like you can get 12% bonus, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, they haven't paid it out in 10 years, Yeah, <laughs> but they're still and using it as an incentive. No, no, no. Exactly. you have to ask specific questions. <laughs> yeah. And a lot of the verbiage kind of surrounding some of those bonuses may, you know, be that, you know, it's based on performance or it's based yeah. on, uh, you know, how the company's performing. So again, yeah. those things might not, might not necessarily be, um, you know, hundred percent guaranteed, like you said, so again, ask those questions. Um, I think that that's really important. The other thing that, you know, you kind of have control over as well is, you know, having those conversations with your family ahead of time. You know, if you know that you're going to be transitioning out of the military in, you know, a year, six months, obviously the more, the more planning that you have to make this transition, the more successful that you're going to be. But obviously there's those circumstances, right? Where, something happens, a life instance happens, you know, you get medically retired and things like that. Yeah. Um, obviously those things might be out of your control, right? But, you know, obviously the more time that you have to have those conversations with your family, you know, with your colleagues um, to ultimately set you up for success is going to make you that much more successful in your transition. But I think starting to have those conversations early with your family of, where do we want to go next? Um, what does that kind of look like? Are we open to relocation? Are we only looking at, you know, this specific market, let's just say Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, the more that you limit yourself to those specific geographical regions, yeah. 
the less opportunities that are going to be, you know, there. And I know a huge push right now for pretty much all of veterans. Uh, a lot of people are looking for those remote opportunities. And if I'm being transparent, remote yeah. opportunities are slowly starting to die down. Now, will there be a comeback? Possibly. Um, you know, I, I feel like it's almost a gamble. You kind of roll the dice and which way the market goes. But, you know, we're seeing a lot of return to office, uh, a lot of more like hybrid type schedules. Um, and unless you're kind of near one of those, you know, larger cities, you may be kind of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, you may be limited, limited. opportunities that you have, um, you know, let's just say if you live on the outskirts or you live in like a small rural area um, and remote may be your only opportunity, right? Obviously, the, the closer that you get to some of those larger cities, the cost of living increases and things like that. Um, and, and it, it definitely has its own other challenge, uh, you know, of trying to live and survive in this economy. But um, the further out that you are and the more rural that you are, the more difficult it could be to land some of those opportunities as some of those remote positions start to kind of die down a little bit. But again, who knows where the market's going to be in the next couple of years. I truly feel like, you know, we're, we're really aligned with more of like a hybrid type schedule. Yeah. There are a lot of remote opportunities that are out there still, but, you know, those are the ones that receive massive amounts of applicants. And again, think about it from this context, right? You have people from all over the world, all 50 states and sometimes even abroad that are applying for these remote positions. So instead of, you know, that, um, let's just say HR, you know, generalist level role that is right down the street, you know, in Wilmington, North Carolina, where I'm at, um, you know, they may only receive 10 applications, right? Uh, or they may have zero applications because yeah, it's an yeah. on-site role. And then you may have a fully remote, you know, HR generalist position that received a thousand applications in 24 hours. So if that kind of tells you anything of, you know, you're essentially a needle in a haystack find, um, it's definitely going to limit your opportunities. So, you know, when I do speak with veterans, I definitely like to bring that up is, you know, keep your options open, you know, don't yeah. necessarily, you know, cut out, you know, non-remote opportunities, but um, that's definitely one thing that you have control over as well. Yeah. And just talk to your family so that they're transitioning to, they're transitioning to, we cannot forget that. So when we come up with our non-negotiables, we need to make sure that they come up with their non-negotiables and we have a family style meeting and we talk about it. We collaborate and we come up with our non-negotiables for our post-service career. My husband and I had a strategy. So our strategy was that he was going to be a stay-at-home dad and football coach. That was our strategy ever since, you know, 18 years ago when we got married because I am always the ambitious one, wanted to get my degrees and certifications and work. You know, and so we had a strategy. Our strategy for the first year when we left the military was for me to land a role, a role, you know, and I had a strategy. I didn't want to be a manager or a director. I wanted to be an HR business partner or a generalist. And I wanted to just sort of learn the ropes of HR, but also get used to not being military. And I knew that that was going to be a mental challenge. And then, you know, the second year out of the military, we had another strategy. Let's see what other role I can get. Let's build our savings account. Let's get to this point where we're financially, you know, stable. And then the third year, I was like, oh, I don't want to work anymore like this hard. This is way too hard. <laughs> this is like, I mean, not, I mean, obviously I work, but I'm just saying like, you know, manufacturing is a beast, you know, 24 hour, you know, four shifts and like HR. I mean, that's a beast. So, you know, once I retired, I started developing like, into a different misty and that's what we should be doing right that's so have those conversations with your family and consider their you know post service career aspirations as well well corey it's been an hour i feel like i can talk to you forever and so <laughs> i'm just going to call it right now me and you we're going to meet again and we're going to have to talk more what do yeah, you think yeah I, I would absolutely love that i think that we have a lot um, you know, of amazing things in this industry to kind of bring to the table and yeah. a lot of, uh, you know, questions that are probably being asked by veterans. So um, I'm absolutely more than willing to, you know, meet again. I think that this would be a great opportunity and maybe even get a live Q&A going. 
I was just going to say that. <laughs> I was just going to say we could do a Q&A HR topics from a real live recruiter that was also a veteran. And so I'm calling it now. I will do it. I'll put it on my calendar to make sure that we schedule that. But as we're ending this episode, I'd love, to, I always ask three questions for my guest um, just to kind of give, you know, veterans um, just something to think about. So what's the best piece of advice that you've ever received? Oh, goodness. Um, let me think about this one here. Um, okay. Let's see. Hmm. <laughs> You're putting me on the spot here. Um, okay. can, <laughs> I can ask you another question and you can think about it. Okay. Is there I, I, I think self- I got it. No, I, I right, think I got ahead. it. So I, I would say not everybody's career is going to look the same. Okay. Um, I, I say this in the aspect of, you know, sometimes on social media, we, we see a lot of people like thriving, um, you know, getting those promotions or, yep. you know, they may have had an easier transition than others, right? No transition is the same, right? Everybody's transition is going to be completely different. Um, how successful you are in that transition definitely depends on how much time, energy, and effort that you put into it. And you get you get out of it what you put in, right? Yeah. But um, some people, their pathways are a little bit different. They may have easily obtained those promotions and they're more of a people person, you know, and they're more of like a, a yes man or a, a yes ma'am. Um, and they can, you know, easily work their way up the corporate ladder. And you, on the other hand, you may have those challenges and you may have to have faced, you know, adversity of, of trying to get that promotion and go through that. Ultimately, I think those things ultimately make you a stronger person and make yeah. you a stronger professional. And there's a reason why your pathway may be a little bit different than others. So I think that's the best piece of advice that I've ever received, um, you know, from some mentors and talent acquisition, because, you know, again, sometimes we see these things and we expect ourselves to kind of be in this position um, you know, and have this kind of life plan, uh, all paved out for us. And it's okay if that life plan doesn't go as expected. Maybe you don't get your degree until you're 42. Maybe you don't get that manager level position until you're in your late forties, or, um, you know, maybe you don't graduate college, but you go down a different pathway. Um, again, as long as you're making those, you know, instrumental points in your life of progress, um, you know, it doesn't matter if it takes you five years, 10 years, 15 years to accomplish it, as long as you've accomplished what you're trying to achieve. Right. Yeah. And, and I always like to tell people, and just from my personal experiences, you know, just be careful that you don't have your ladder up against the wrong wall. Yeah. That's a great you know? point too. You know, sometimes, and- uh, you may, you know, have everything, um, that's ultimately pointing you in that direction, but you could yep. be, you know, with the wrong company. Right. Um, yeah, and that's or, a thing too. Yeah. And a lot of people, I mean, just speaking from personal experience, a lot of people that are thriving at work, they're not at home, you know? And, and so, I mean, one of the, the, the main reason why I decided to leave the company that I was at was because, you know, I needed to be able to be in my son's life. I was already out of his life when I was in the military. And then I was consciously making the decision to not be present, you know, when I'm out of the military. And so those people that are thriving in one area of their life, there is another area that is suffering. And whether it's intentional or not, just know that there's another area in their life that is suffering. And also like, you know, the military and you're, you're familiar with it too, but in the military, we were supposed to thrive. Everything, like when I made master sergeant, everyone was like, so what's your plan for senior? When I made senior, it's like, what's your plan for chief? Can I just enjoy where I'm at? (laughs) Like, I don't know how you feel about that, Corey, but like in the military, we never had an opportunity to, you know, celebrate our achievements. And now in the civilian sector, you can celebrate your achievements. You can stay right where you're at. You know what I mean? You don't have to be promoted. You don't have to be a manager. You don't, I mean, of course, like making more money is important, but at a certain point, past a certain amount of money, like you just get more bills. <laughs> like, yeah. You know what I mean? So you just have to really kind of weigh the pros and cons, but that's good. All right. So is there a self-help book or a podcast or something that you listen to and and that you believe would be beneficial to veterans? Yeah. I mean, ultimately just networking with other veterans has been extremely helpful and, you know, kind of learning, you know, 
that they're going through some of the similar things that you may be going through, right? Um, at times during the transition, there was times where I felt alone, like I didn't have the resources, um, you know, that I was kind of going through this by myself, but thousands of veterans transition from the military, you know, every day. Um, so with that being said, you know, don't feel like you need to go through this transition by yourself. There is a countless amount of veterans that are out there that are willing and able to kind of lend their subject matter expertise, you know, resources, um, you know, that you probably never even thought of um, and programs that can ultimately help you, you know, with your transition. But again, don't expect it to be handed to you. You're going to have to put in some of that work. Um, in terms of like professional development books, there is a countless amount of books that I probably went through and I'm still, you know, currently reading. Um, each month, I probably try to at least, you know, read one book just on kind of self-development, self-improvement. Um, one book that really stood out to me, um, I wrote it down here. Let me, uh, uh, it's Making Work Work. Um, yeah. Let me see if I have it over here. It's over here somewhere, but um, it's a great book about kind of, uh, making work kind of work for you and setting those priorities, developing healthy boundaries. And I think that that is something that was instrumental to me because again, being in the military, sometimes you, you just have to say yes and just go with it. You don't really have control. Um, but now things are a little bit different. You're able to communicate when you're overwhelmed, you're able to, you know, set those healthier boundaries at work for a proper work-life balance. So you're not burnt out. Yeah. And, you know, uh, just start seeing what works and what doesn't work. Some books are great, some books not so much, and they may not be as helpful. And then if it's in pertaining to like HR industry specific, um, you know, I have a ton of different HR books and resources that I read, um, you know, very regularly. And I go back and reference them from time to time too. Um, sometimes things change, but for the most part, you know, talent acquisition and recruitment um, you know, things have kind of been standard across the board. So sometimes yeah. I dive back in, I'll read those things just to kind of refresh my memory. Um, so if anybody's interested in any HR specific resources or tools, uh, you know, they're early in their careers and they're looking for some tools to kind of help set themselves up for success and get more of that work-life balance, feel free to message me. I'm more than happy to share those resources. Awesome. All right. And Last question. What's one daily habit that you practice that moves the needle forward for your life? Yeah. Uh, calendar, calendar blocking for sure. Oh my um, gosh. Yes. Especially Make in it. HR. Um, yes. I, I could not be where I am today. And, you know, when I started off as a recruiter early on in my career, I struggled at first. Um, there was just so many tasks where I had to bounce back and forth and try to stay on top of it all. You know, I was working later hours and, you know, I was getting burnt out very quickly, but over time, you know, I, I kind of read some of those resources about calendar blocking and setting your schedule. And again, sometimes it is trial and error. You do have to kind of go through, see what works for you, what doesn't work for you, but making sure that you set time aside for, you know, professional development and growth, and then also setting time, you know, aside for administrative things that may fall through the cracks every day. Um, and that's been critical for me. And I work out of Outlook a lot. So I, I yeah. constantly set those reminders and set those reminders to remind myself to yes. go and do that task. Um, and I think that that's very important, you know, to set yourself up as a, a successful HR professional as well. Yeah. And that and batching. So like, you know, I, I, not everyone can do it, but you also like, we have to be careful too. Like everything that comes our way via a message, a, a text or a phone call, a hiring manager wanting this, blah, blah, blah. Like, is it urgent? <laughs> is it, is it an emergency? You know? And so those are things that we need to consider, but batching is important. So I would like do my best to like do sourcing one day, you know, or phone calls another day or whatever it may be. And so that way you have one specific day where you're really trying to focus on things because task switching is real. And, and if anyone does any research, multitasking doesn't work. So that's why you have to effectively task switch. Oh yeah. And I could probably do an entire podcast itself on like yeah. how to set up your calendar for success and recruitment. So if that's ever a topic we want to dive into. Maybe we just into. need to do a series. <laughs> No, this is good. And so, it, yeah, and I'm I'm good with podcasts going super long. I know there's some, you know, feedback out there like, oh, keep them short. Well, then just don't listen to it. So, 
<laughs> but it's been great talking to you. Um, you know, some some of the themes that I heard from you is like transferable skills, network, you know, and then just control the controllables. And those are things that at Bets to PM we truly preach about. So anyone that's interested when it comes to human resources, where can they find you, Corey? Yeah, of course. I'm very active on LinkedIn. So um, for those you that are. are on LinkedIn, uh, please feel free to reach out, send a connection request. If you have any you know, questions about how I got started in HR, or talent acquisition, recruitment, um, you know, please feel free to reach out. I will gladly accept your request and we'll connect. Um, if you're looking for any informational interviews, we can connect. I also have a pretty extensive uh, network of HR professionals. So if there's another industry that you're looking to kind of, you know, get some subject matter expertise from, please feel free to reach out. I'm, you know, happy to connect you with HR business partners, HR generalists, compensation partners, you know, you name it. I probably have it in my network. That's awesome. And then one last thing that you preached was the DOD skill bridge. And so any last rounds on how important that program was for your career development? Absolutely. And, you know, uh, skill bridge is definitely super important to being able to set yourself, or yourself up for success, especially if you may not have a lot of those HR skills or that HR background, right? Um, I will say this about skills bridge. There are uh, companies that are out there um, that they may, you know, have good face value at first and, and say that they're here for this skill bridge opportunity. But just like how you would interview for a job, interview for your skill bridge as well. Um, yes. Unfortunately, there's a lot of companies that are out there that do take advantage of free labor. Free um, labor unfortunately, yeah. I've seen it. And, you know, some questions that you definitely want to ask as you're applying to the skill bridge is, you know, do you have, you know, an allocated position uh, to hire, you know, for somebody in this role upon completion of the skill bridge? right? That's exactly what SkillBridge was designed for is ultimately, you know, leading to a pathway for employment. Um, so I would hate for, you know, a transitioning service member to go through, you know, be taken advantage of for free labor, essentially, and then not have that opportunity for successful employment after the fact. So yeah. definitely ask those questions, you know, surrounding, is this a good fit for me? What skills, you know, and, and um, you know, uh, Training tools can I develop as I go through this skill bridge opportunity? And, you know, what does your placement rate look like for people who have gone through skill bridge? I think that that's another important question to ask because if companies, you know, they may say that they're veteran friendly, right? But that doesn't necessarily always mean that they're veteran ready, right? Um, and I think that there's a big difference there. Yeah. We could probably launch a podcast on that one as well. Yeah, like we're, we're already doing a series. <laughs> I'm here for it. <laughs> Yeah, and I and one thing about Skillbridge too is that there are companies out there that are transparent. Hey, we don't have a budgeted position, but we're in a position where we want to help veterans. So what we can do for you is provide you this, 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 and this. And so if you go into it knowing what the end result will be, then they're they're a veteran friendly, veteran ready company. Some companies just don't have allocations, you know tons and tons to, um, to give away. So just be mindful of that. You know, if a company says, actually, we, we don't have a placement rate, but we can train you, we can give you on the job training, we can get your resume ready, we can connect you with our, you know, our industry partners or whatever it is, then that's a, that's a win too. And then you get to decide, right? It's in, again, what do you get to control? So all right. Well, awesome, Corey. So we're going to be back because we've already decided that we're going to do a, a full on series, just Misty and Corey talking recruitment. And I love that too. Um, but thank you so much for everything that you do. Yes, go follow Corey on LinkedIn. He's a, a prime example of depositing into your network before you withdraw. And you can tell, like, obviously he's successful. He's defined his definition of success. He's rocking it in the HR career field and you can too. And so, you know, take advantage of you know, your transferable skills, utilize the SkillBridge program, and then network, network, network. And so you guys go and network with Corey, and we'll see you back next episode. Thanks again, Corey. Awesome. Thank you, Misty. Thank you for tuning in to today's episode of the Military Transition Podcast, Human Resources Pathfinder Series. I hope you found our discussion with Corey insightful and inspiring. Corey's journey from a hospital corpsman in the Navy to a successful talent acquisition partner in the healthcare industry, 
showcases the incredible potential and versatility of veterans in the HR field. If you found today's episode helpful, please share it with your fellow veterans and friends. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode filled with more HR tips, tools, and career advice tailored to the veteran community. We'd love to hear from you. If you have any questions, feedback, or topics you'd like us to cover, feel free to reach out to us. You can connect with me, Misty Marino, on LinkedIn, or visit our website at vets2pm.com for more resources and support. Until next time, stay motivated, stay focused, and remember that your military experience is a powerful asset in the civilian workforce. Keep pushing forward on your career path, and we'll be here to guide you every step of the way. Take care and talk to you soon.